All right, thank you so much for your patience. Is everyone able to hear me now? Oh, good evening. Thank you very much for attending Colorism in the Black Community Part One. My name is Shay Shagun and I serve as the Outreach Coordinator for the Action for Black Lives Initiative. And on behalf of the initiative, we welcome to you to our very first event for the year. We also want to extend thanks to Dean Melissa Begg, who is the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work for her constant championship of this program, as well as all the different members on this panel and her work to make anti-Black racism a very prevalent and seriously taken issue here at the Columbia School of Social Work. So today what we're going to be having is a discussion on colorism in the Black community. We will have a 45 minute panel and from there, we're going to transition into facilitated breakout sessions. Before we start, we wanted to kindly ask everyone, first of all, if you would just like to see the participants, you are going to go into your video settings and there will be a button that you will see. It's on the um, very bottom bar, the toolbar. You should see a arrow from there. And when you click on the arrow, when you scroll down, there should be an option to turn off video for non-video sharing participants. Should you have any issues with those, um, with doing that, please contact Samantha or Chris, who are both um, participants as well in the event. Furthermore, if you have not chosen your affinity group, please also contact Samantha or Chris as our breakout sessions, as mentioned, are going to be based off of affinity group. The whole ethos of this is to make sure that we have a safe environment for our Black identifying students and participants to share their experiences around colorism. So with that being said, we will start off our presentation and thank you so much again for your attendance. Okay. So why this issue of colorism? As we speak very closely right now and clearly about anti-Blackness, one of the things that we're also dealing with in the Black community is how does this show up for us as well? So then we talk about this issue of colorism. As we've defined it, colorism is a form of anti-Blackness that came out of white supremacy, which preferences lighter skin tones over dark ones within communities of the same racial or ethnic group. Very simply, it is a form of discrimination and it is a form of prejudice. Colorism is not something that is unique to the United States, but for the context of this event, we're going to speak of colorism in the United States. Colorism as well is something that we see as a common phenomenon in all, pretty much all nations where there are black and brown persons who reside in those areas. So colorism starts with slavery, chattel slavery specifically, which was the enslavement of African persons who were unwillingly taken from the African continent in order to build wealth for the new world, the United States being part of that new world. When you were considered a slave, you were actually not legally a person. This meant that you couldn't enter into civil contracts such as marriage or own property. And also you weren't considered a citizen. So we start to see that blackness equals um, some kind of subjugation and not even some kind, it is complete subjugation. You're not considered a human being, even up until 1787. That's when we have the Continental Congress. And then we talk about um, the three-fifths compromise, which made black persons three-fifths of the population in order to increase the population of the southern, um, the southern states, which is also unfolded into the current electoral college that we currently have. So again, blackness is enslavement and whiteness is liberty and you are now property versus being a human being. So again, moving on to this idea of rape and the mulatto class, one of the features of colorism that makes it so insidious is that we had slave owners who would rape the enslaved women. Your racial dictation at that point was by, um, by virtue of your mother. So for example, if your mother was an enslaved person even though you could be half white, at the same time, you would still be considered a black person because your mother was of African descent. And that's what made it such that this was an act of violence against black bodies in order to continue 
increasing the wealth of the slave owners and creating, you know, immediately their own persons who are responsible for tending to the land. One thing that's very important to note is that then that we have this mulatto class that's born and mulatto, for those who are not aware, it is considered a derogatory term. However, at that time, that was the term that was considered and that was the term that was used for those who were mixed race. One of the things that we notice about colorism and how it starts to manifest through that is those who were of lighter skin started to be the slaves who were able to work in their slave master's home. They had opportunities and access to education and also understanding how white persons at that time moved around in society. So we have that as well. But something that people also need to notice and learn is that when slaves who were lighter skin were sold, they were actually sold at a higher rate than those who were darker than them. Certainly this has not made this has not made any better. However, it is important to notice things like this as even the whole belief and idea that the color of your skin makes you more valuable is something that we see very early on. So we give this very brief history and for those who are black identifying, much of this is not something that is nouveau to them. But with that being said, understanding these bits of history starts to let us see the insidious nature of this and why we've seen it as a representation of, you know, internalized racism for those of us who identify as black. So then we have this one drop rule. We see that with the one drop rule, this is a way that the white ruling class wanted to continue to make this differentiation between themselves and those who were of any type of African descent. This is something also called hypo descent. So this meant that whatever degree of African ancestry you had, you had, excuse me, was enough to make you a Negro or a black person. Again, Negro is a term that is a derogatory term to talk about somebody who is black. Black people in the United States, we use black or we use African American or whichever part of the diaspora with which we identify. So why a conversation of colorism? We have talked about this extensively at the Columbia School of Social Work, and we are working towards combating anti-Black racism. Colorism is one of those things that is also a manifestation of this as we start to see that regardless, white supremacy is something that gave birth to, we have racism in this, and how these forms of discrimination or prejudice are passed on to different communities of color as a way to continue enslaving ourselves and subjugating our psyches. So we're working towards this conversation around collective liberation, but at the end of the day too, this is a conversation that is very new for us to be to have as it is a very taboo thing in the black community. But we know all, we know this exists and it's something that all of us have very personal relationships with. And I'm very grateful to our um, four panelists today and our moderator, Dean Carmelo, for participating in this conversation and sharing their experiences with this. Certainly, this is not going to be the end all be all, but we do believe again that when you see multiple persons having a similar experience, those aren't outlier experiences. That's a phenomenon at that point that continues to happen. So with that, I'm going to introduce our panelists. And from there, I will turn the conversation over to Dean Carmelo, who will moderate the event. So Dean Carmelo is the Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion at Columbia University School of Social Work. She's been, in the, she's been with us since May 2018 and officially opened the school's Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion after transitioning out of her prior position of Director of the Offices of Enrollment, Student Services and Financial Aid at the School of um, Social Work. She has more than 17 years of experience in student affairs and in many other and many years of experience conducting workshops and facilitating dialogues on diversity self-awareness and critical conversations. Prior to joining the Columbia School of Social Work, she was an Associated Press award-winning newsletter journalist, newspaper journalist in Southeast Texas. Dr. Ovita Williams is the Associate Director of Field Education for Family, 
Youth and Children's Services at Columbia School of Social Work. She is also the Executive Director for the Columbia University School of Social Work Action for Social Justice Lab. So we thank Dr. Williams for her excellent leadership. Dr. Williams has taught the Social Work Practice and Domestic Violence course at the Columbia School of Social Work and the Social Work Practice Lab for Liberation and Social Justice at Silverman School of Social Work at Hunter um, City, of, uh, City University of New York. Dr. Williams is a licensed clinical social worker specializing in intimate partner violence and forensic social work practice, excuse me, with 10 years of experience as the director of clinical services and the counseling services unit at the Kings County District's attorney, attorney office. Prior to this position, Dr. Williams was a therapist at the Children's Aid Society. Furthermore, during her time at CSSW, also called Columbia School of Social Work, Dr. Williams facilitated the seminar in field education for a new field instructor for new field instructors and expanded the advanced seminar and field instruction around holding a critical conversation in the supervisory relationship. She is a graduate of Vassar College of Col Vassar College and Columbia University. She received her PhD from the City University of New York Graduate Center, Silverman School of Social Welfare. Her dissertation addresses the impact of stress, vicarious trauma, and structural racism on social workers practicing in district attorney offices while supporting intimate partner violence. Dr. Williams is a co-author on the recent book, Learning to Teach, Teaching to Learn, a guide for social work field education, published by the Council on Social Work Education. Next, we have Dr. Jelana Harris. Dr. Harris is a licensed psychotherapist, certified hypnotherapist, certified life coach and consultant based in New York City. She is a full-time lecturer at Columbia University School of Social Work and operates a private practice in New York City, providing therapy and coaching to individuals, couples, and families. Dr. Harris also hosts solution-focused conversations and facilitates workshops for professional organizations geared towards the social, emotional, and psychological development of traditionally oppressed populations. Dr. Harris completed her Doctor of Philosophy in Social Welfare at Stony Brook University, where she also received her MSW and was a distinguished Turner Fellow. She has an extensive history in social development and community orga organizing, having worked as a Director of Youth and Family Programs for the New York City Parks, De Parks Department, overseeing the training and program development for 35 youth programs in the five boroughs. She also worked as a trainer and facilitator for Planned Parenthood of Nassau County, developing and implementing trainings and workshops on sexual sexuality education program. Dr. Harris is a returned Peace Corps volunteer, having served in the Dominican Republic, where she's worked with small business owners governments and local non-governmental organizations providing training and facilitation in English and Spanish on strategic planning, leadership, and program development. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, with majors in both business economics and dance. She also received certificates in dance and music from both the Edna Moundley School of the Performing Arts in Kingston, Jamaica, and the University of Havana in Havana, Cuba. We have Dr. Eva Haldane. Dr. Haldane runs a consulting firm, ECH Consulting, where she teaches communities of color about mental health and speaks and writes about living with mental illnesses and creates programming for children. Dr. Haldane has 13 years of experience in the nonprofit sector where she conducted program evaluations and is currently working in program quality improvement. Her research interests include fatherhood, mental health, and mental health stigma in communities of color and trauma. She is a huge fan of research and data analysis and hopes her work will relive the, relieve excuse me, the fear that surrounds these two. She earned her Bachelor of Arts from Swift College and her MSW and PhD from Columbia School of Social Work. And lastly, our fourth panelist. 
Mariam Kante is currently an MSW candidate in the Advanced Generalist Practice Program at Columbia University. Mariam is also one of the student leaders for the Action for Social Justice Lab here at Columbia. Before Columbia, she spends years working within the social services field, such as mental health, women's rights, and international human rights. Mariam is currently an elementary school educator working with predominantly black and brown students. She has a special interest in creating access to a world-class education for marginalized populations. Her core belief is working within a social justice lens and believes that that is the key instrument to reshaping the narrative for marginalized populations. Mariam holds a BA in social sciences with a concentration in psychology from Tura College in New York. She's interested in working with intimate partner violence survivors and children of survivors in hopes of bringing a voice to their stories and creating a space for them in society. This year, as a recipient of the Stephen P. Shinkley Innovation Fellowship, Mariam will work closely with members of the Office for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion to contribute to the DEI Virtual Training Development Program. She's currently also committed to bringing light forever to the injustice Black individuals have faced. So with that, I will turn the conversation over to Dr. Lowe. Thank you very much. Thanks, Shafi. Not a doctor yet. <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us this evening. I'm really excited to have this be part of this conversation with my, my colleagues and our student, Mariam. So to get the conversation started, I'm, I'm gonna ask our panelists to share a bit about your cultural background and how you've seen colorism um, present and what it looks like in your community. And I'm gonna start with the, Dr. Williams. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Shayi. Thank you, Karma. Uh, and to the panelists, so happy to be here with you all. Uh, so I um, identify as a Black Afro-Caribbean. My family immigrated here from Guyana, South America in 1968 when I was an infant. And they actually left me back home in Guyana so that my grandparents could raise me and they could come here to the States and be able to uh, provide for us and make a way for us and the rest of the family to immigrate to the US. And they actually immigrated right here to Brooklyn, New York. And um, <clears throat> so, you know, in terms of the, the, the conversation tonight around colorism, um, my, even within my own family in Guyana, there are six races. That's kind of what is described when you talk to people. And color was such a huge part of the way that we um, talked about um, one another. So even within my own family, my mom, is light-skinned, my dad, and would be considered Dutch Portuguese in Guyana. And my father is darker complexioned and had an Indian mom and a black dad. Uh, so even from the beginning of their own relationships, I heard stories, I continue to hear stories of his family not wanting him to marry my mother. And really based on class and skin color. Um, and so from, I still hear those stories, you know, of my grandfather not wanting to come to the wedding. Um, and so, you know, that, that, was, that was huge, you know, just talking about how colorism lives in our own families, our own community. And my, I'm the oldest of four um, women four girls, and three of us are darker complexioned, and I have a sister who's lighter complexioned. And it was always a thing, you know. My lighter skinned sister was my dad's favorite. She was the one that all the boys wanted to date. I would go to parties and I would be in the corner, you know. So it, it, it and, and then being in school. So, you know, I, I'm happy to be here tonight to sort of really have this conversation because it's something we don't talk about, but it hits very close to home. And, um, I, you know, we, we carry that. We carry that into our lives. I carry that into my daily experience, thinking constantly about, you know, how do I measure up? 
how do we compare each other? And we compare each other, especially women, uh, across, we can't compare each other in the Black community, in the Caribbean community for sure, across who's light-skinned and who's dark-skinned. And so that's sort of a little bit of who I am and how I sort of come to this space. As you're talking, Ovita, it completely resonates with me. I'm originally from Jamaica, very similar to you, born there. I was there for the early years until I was about eight. And my mom is Scottish Indian. My dad is Black American. And there was my grandmother, basically, the Indian. My grandmother's Indian. She basically disowned my mom and didn't talk to her for years around that because my dad was so dark-skinned. So, yeah, when we talk about colorism in in the Caribbean and how that sort of sits with you, it just really resonated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Haldane, can you tell us a bit about your cultural background and, and how you've sort of seen um, colorism in your community? Sure. So, um, so I'm first generation. My mom is from Jamaica, so she came here when she was little, but my dad is African-American. Um, and they're both pretty fair, but my one thing my father always would say is he's part Native American. He has nothing to back this up. And since then, like 23 and me has totally proven him wrong. He is no Native American in his bloodline whatsoever, but that was always a source of pride for him to kind of explain why he was lighter and why his hair was so curly. Um, For me, um, I guess I look ambiguous. So no one really knew what I was. So I often was asked, especially when I was little, like, what are you? Um, And I would often just say black. And then like, that was when the questions would come, are you mixed? Um, are you sure? Do you know your dad? And it was a lot of, a lot of questioning. So for me, like being lighter made people confused about where I stood in the community. Um, I guess that's it for now. Thanks, Dr. Haldane. Dr. Harris, can you share your cultural background and how colorism has, has showed up in that community in your personal life as well? Sure. So um, I identify as Black American, uh, although my mom's, uh, her father's side of the family is from St. Kitts. Um, I definitely grew up with colorism and, and Dr. Haldane, what you're talking about really resonates with me. There was sort of a a way that the family celebrated white, white ancestry and um, really, you know, made a point of announcing that in some ways, um, which was something that was really, you know, I struggled with, I think, early on. Um, my mom is, is is lighter skinned, my dad's darker skinned, and in, on my mom's side of the family, her kids, are, my, me and my siblings, we're the darker ones in that in that family, um, and my dad's side of the families were actually the lighter ones. Um, I'm actually the lighter, the probably the lightest sibling in my family. Um, complexion really wasn't, well, I should say colorism in terms of uh, light skin or dark skin wasn't really something that was spoken up a lot, but just to kind of expand this conversation around phenotype and hair texture, that was something I heard quite frequently. Um, a lot of folks in my family have like very narrow noses. I didn't, um, but then I had hair that people framed as good hair, right? And so those became conversations around those sorts of distinctions. Um, And this really, really took a hold of me, you know, uh, around the time I went to college and I did a lot of traveling abroad, a lot of traveling in the Caribbean. And I would get those same sorts of questions. Like, are you, are you black American? Well, you don't look like the typical black American. Are you sure? The same kinds of like, I, like, as if I don't know where my family is from. Um, And so that, you know, really became something that I I really started to feel really uh, passionate about. And in fact, I did my master's thesis on uh, the concept of folks distancing themselves from blackness, um, in, in various ways around um, colorism, hair texture, and things of that nature. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Miriam, can you talk about your cultural background and how you've seen colorism uh, play out in your community? Yeah, um, so I come from the West African tribe. I come from a, Ning- a Mandingo tribe. Um, colorism was just out there in our face, right? Um, the lighter you are, the more pretty you are. It was the light-skinned ones would get the better husband. Um, And I saw colorism early on. I remember my mom used to say, oh, you and your dad are the dark-skinned ones and me and and your brother are the light-skinned ones. So you guys go over there and we'll stay over here. Um, And I began to internalize it so much growing up. Um, 
And I shared with Shay earlier, from 2017 to 2019, I started bleaching my skin. So I was four shades darker than what you see right now on the screen, but I was chasing this beauty. And this beauty is this lighter tone. And any product that you could imagine, I used because I was just dark and that wasn't beautiful. Um, and I always get questions when they see the old picture of the old Miriam as to why did you do this? And I can't explain it. I really can. It's like, I hated my dark skin. And even now when I look at my dark skin pictures, I'm just like, this is ugly. I don't want to see it. And I still have traces of this colorism from growing up from just one single comment of you're too dark. Um, or even with my dad, he used to say so early on, you should definitely go to school because you're very dark. So that doesn't mean that you're going to get a great husband. So you just better get that degree. Um, and that's just how I've walked through society with dark, ugly, find something else to depend on. I'm wondering if some of our other panelists can also speak to that, just sort of this impact of the messages that we've gotten growing up around your proximity to whiteness versus your proximity to blackness being one being better over the other and how that you know affected your identity as you were growing up. Um, I can start. I feel very lucky because my mom, um, maybe it's because she's from Jamaica and everyone she saw a lot of black people of different shades and she wasn't really it didn't really it wasn't her thing. So I never got the don't sit in the sun too long. I never got anything like that. Um, I think she was lucky because she could not do hair. And so like, I guess she got, she lucked out because my hair is pretty easy to manage. Um, but she, I didn't have that experience that my panelists or my fellow panelists were talking about. And I feel very lucky. Like I definitely got comments from other people remarking on my, um, like on my hair or, um, on my skin color, but thankfully my family didn't, it didn't come from my family, it would just normally come from like people at school. And it was always like a pretty big nerd. So I don't think they were worried about me staying in school. Although now I think they wish that they had told me to get married because I'm not doing that. But um, I, I feel very lucky, but I know that, you know, with peers, like when I was little and I'm probably going to date myself, they would say like African booty scratcher if you were dark and like they definitely would like tease you, but it wasn't um, like a, it would be like a day and then they'd move on to something else. It wasn't, at least that's how I remember it. And I can acknowledge that I was super privileged and didn't like I wasn't teased for my skin color or my hair. So it's very, I could have very easily just been like oblivious or ignoring it, but um, for me, that wasn't it. It was mostly um, related to my blackness. Like, was I black? So. Dr. Williams or Dr. Harris, you want to comment or add? Yeah. Go so I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Williams. <laughs> I, I, I feel like, you know, my mom was really um, pro-black. She painted our dolls black, like when they weren't any, like she, she really went out of her way, I think, to make um, us feel comfortable in our skin. So these were kinds of things I heard when I stepped in with my cousins or grandparents, you know, like I would hear those sorts of things when I stepped outside of my nuclear family. Um, and like I said, for me, there was what I heard more were, were things about phenotype, which is really interesting. I think I didn't pay much attention to my complexion. And maybe it was, you know, sort of going with Dr. Haldane was saying, and maybe because I was a lighter person in my family that I didn't really absorb that. But I, I, I remember the messages about the things about me that were different. And so definitely, again, my siblings all have like this very narrow nose. Um, or what we call the white nose. And so, and I didn't. So that was, those are things that really always stuck out to me. I would always be told to pinch, pinch your nose, pinch your nose, like as if I could change the shape. Um, and I thought I could when I was younger. Um, and so those are things that I think I, I grew up really having a complex around. Um, 
And, and, you know, it's an interesting thing too, like, and when I got into college and this was before the quote unquote natural hair movement took off and I, I went natural because I was uh, really about trying to find a way to embrace who I was and, and how I looked. Um, and that really was just not, uh, not palatable to my family. Like they were like, why are you doing that? That's crazy. But then at the same time, I would hear these things like, well, you can do that because you have good hair. And it was this really conflictual message around that. So, um, you know, for me, this has really been a lifelong journey. And even just saying like the quote unquote natural hair movement, because I feel like it's not a natural hair movement, it's a curly hair movement. Um, I don't feel like natural people are still slicking their edges down, people are permanent edges, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's only acceptable in the sense that you're, you still have this hair that looks a little ambiguous or, um, you don't see people representing that movement with like tight, whatever the hair typing system, right? But like hair that is um, co really coily. So um, that, that's that been my experience with it. I feel like this, there's so much, con so many contradictory messages that I received around it that, you know, I still, you know, sort of like Miriam was saying, I'm still moving through that space and learning to really love and accept myself just exactly as I am. Yeah, I mean, you know, what everybody's saying is just resonating in so many different ways, you know, but, um, you know, it's interesting that, you know, Jelana, what you're saying, it's like a, a natural hair movement, like the fact that we're even calling it a movement is already saying that somehow it just shouldn't be, right? And so I, I have locks, I've put my head locks for the last five years, and it took me 20 years to decide to do it. Because like you said, this good hair, bad hair thing is what, you know, I also heard a lot about. Um, and, you know, I, I felt, I feel the most free that I've ever felt in my life. I did braids, I did, I did straightening, I did short, I did crop, I did Caesar, everything else but lock the hair, you know, because the connotation, especially in the Caribbean, is that you're Rasta. And then, and then that, that has a whole nother connotation to it. I am not Rasta, Farian. Um, but, you know, so there's all that. But, you know, Marion, what you were saying really touched my heart, you know, that this idea of whitening, you know, and, and it's like in, it's in music, it's in reggae music and soca music. You hear often, yeah, you're whitening your skin and high yellow. And there's a, a Calypso artist that, were, that was called Yellow Man. Like, it, it, you know, even though I felt like in my own family that there was positivity, if you will, there were, there were always messages. There were always messages about, you know, red, you know, everyone would say, oh, the baby's born, the baby's red, she red like she mother, you know, <laughs> right? Miriam's like, right. And, and you hear it, you know, oh, she black, black, black soul, you know, you, so you hear it and you, 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 it's naturally, you take it in that somehow there's something wrong with the baby who's dark. I remember when my niece was born about 16 years ago, my mom was in the operating room and the baby comes out, my, she comes out the hospital and my mom like says, oh, the baby's ear is dark. She's going to get the color of her ear. You know, and I'm like, I never heard that before. Right. And it's like, what, what, what does that have to matter? Right. Um, so it just was those constant ways that you knew that there was some difference depending on your skin color, even if it wasn't necessarily said to you or, you know, my parents didn't say or it wasn't derogatory, it was still these subtle and overt kind of messages. Um, uh, and then sort of fast forwarding to college and being in a place where realizing very quickly at a predominantly white institution that, you know, racism, I grew up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn, I grew up in a very Caribbean uh, neighborhood and, you know, going to an all white university, many of our experiences as black folks is like, you know, shell shock. And so I get there and I'm one of only a few. And, you know, it, 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 it played out there, you know, just in terms of, yes, we have the black student caucus, but even within the black student caucus, it was like the light skin women got the men. Or, you know, or it's just like, what? Or, or prettier or, 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 or were chosen for, you know, the, 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 the different kinds of activities on campus. You know, the fashion show had light-skinned people in it. But this is the Black Student Caucus. I don't understand. Um, and then when I went to Howard University for a semester, that was blatant. 
I mean, it was just blatant. It was, you know, when you think about sororities and fraternities, of which I was never a part of, but there was the brown bag rule, right? So if you were darker than the color of a brown paper bag, you wouldn't even get into some sororities. Um, and so you saw it play out. You saw the shading play out and who was able to get into those kinds of, you know, really um, those kind of organizations that were huge in the Black community that it just sort of even played out there. So um, those are just some of the ways that all across the walks of my life, it's just, it, you know, and I think that I try to t be not that person with my own daughter. My daughter uh, is a young woman now, and she's lighter. She's light and darker. And her father was biracial. Um, and I think back 30 years ago to where I might have been in, in even choosing a partner that was a light skin person and then having you know my child and really listening to her talk about how colorism plays out in her generation you know online with her friends the friends that are around her and so it's complicated <laughs> it's complicated that's so complicated and Aaron, thank you for for sharing that and being so vulnerable with us in this in this space, and I'm wondering if you could talk a bit more around sort of the the, the standards of beauty, the, the messaging that you receive or that we even see today, right? Around if we look at television, magazines, sort of what is this messaging around privileging the skin of lighter skin folks versus darker skin folks? Yeah, absolutely. Um, always. Growing up, you know, I watched the video Vixens. I shouldn't have been watching that at that age, but you can now sneak and watch BET, the award show. They were always lighter than I was. So that was one. And I remember when I first started working, I would always look for someone in a position of power that looked like me. I was just so hungry to find someone that looked like me and made it. Um, and there was none. So that was another message dark women don't make it up there. So something's wrong. Um, and then I went to Toro, which was a predominantly Jewish school. There were no black people there. I was just like this pepper that was just sticking out. Um, I came to Columbia. It's a few of us there. Um, even in the education, right? Like I'm a black educator, but there's not many of us there either. When you think of a teacher, you think of a white woman with her mini skirt, that's it. Um, so the message I got was just blacks, not right. That's it. Um, and I still deal with that, but I think now, like um, Dr. Harris said, there's a movement, right? Like we're celebrating darker skin. Now on social media, you see black is beautiful, black girl magic, but that's now, that's just started. Um, and I'm 25. So the message I've got up until three years ago was your skin isn't right. Um, and I had a meeting with Dr. Williams yesterday and she was just like, I'm here for you and I'm here to help you. And I'm here to support you. Let me even rephrase that. I'm here to support you. You. And I was just sitting in there. And I was just like, wow, someone who looks like me finally made it. And I can finally go to someone. But I've been searching for this one person for 25 years that looks like me, probably talks like me in a way because I talk very different. Um, and I couldn't find her. And now she's my boss, right? So I'm just like, oh, we do make it. There is room for success. And even one of my students is on this call right now. She is a darker skin. And I made sure she came on this call because she is eight years old. And the message that I do want her to get is that your dark skin is beautiful, right? She's so smart and her name is Tony, and I'm so proud of her. But the reason why I want her here is for her to see black women in such a highlight. Um, because growing up at eight years old, I couldn't find people who look like me. So Tony, if you are listening, and I hope you are, just know that women who look like you do make it. There is room for you and you will make it. You will not be like me. You won't make the mistakes that I made. And I am so, so proud. So I'm going to hang up the mic now so I won't start crying. Thank you, Ms. Conti. Thank you, Miriam. And, and you gave me the perfect segue. I, you know, my next question for our, our panelists was going to be how we see, or how do you see colorism playing out in academia, whether that's K through 12 education and or on the university level, which I think I know, you know 
Dr. Haldane, you've got a little bit of both experience there and, and, and Dr. Williams with your work as well, and Dr. Harris. So it's an open question if anyone can talk about just sort of either from your personal experience or just what you've observed with respect to colorism in academia. Um, so what I have, I mean, academia is tough. So Carmen knows that I am a, a soon to be academia dropout. I got my PhD and I was like, I'm out, I'm not doing it. Although I'm still here teaching. Um, I've seen a lot more sexism. I haven't seen that many black women, to be honest, I haven't seen really any black women here. Like in my PhD program, I was the only black person. I know I'm the first, my dissertation advisor is a black male professor here. I'm his first black student in over a decade. So there's, we just weren't here. And I know in the past three, maybe five to three years, we've gotten a lot more black staff at Columbia. But when I was a student here, there was like, when I was a master's student, there were maybe, Clarina was here, Dr. Williams was here, Karma was here, Vinci was here. I think that might have been it. Like it was just us. <laughs> so, and um, so I just never see us here. But now, in this, especially in this COVID world, I'm meeting so many Black professors of so many different races, I'm seeing my peers of Dr. Hughes having a lot more trouble though. Like they will report things that students say to them. And I don't know if it's because maybe I'm younger, maybe it's because I'm fair. I don't have the situations that they've had where, you know, people are just like blatantly disrespectful to their face. Um, but like it, it's tough, it's tough out there. But I definitely have been lucky. I haven't had the experiences that some of my darker peers have had with just students either like going totally ham over their grades and not respecting that their professor refuses to call them doctor or whatever. Um, you know, having, especially now that we're, it's okay, it's cool to talk about racism, having a lot of like their white peers try to like co-op their work and have them do the work for them or, you know, expend that labor. Um, and again, I've just chosen to disengage. It's really stressful and my mental health matters too much, so I don't, but it, it's tough out there. It's also tough outside of academia too, but it's real tough in academia. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for saying that, um, Eva. And I'm so glad to see you. I was like so excited. I didn't even know you got your doctorate, but congratulations. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it's like, it's tough. It's complicated. Um, and, you know, you're, you're one of the few, you're one of the, the few just in these spaces, you know, the, the kind of meetings I go to, or even in my job in the, in the fields education department, when I say I'm from Columbia University on the phone, and then I show up at an agency and they see me, it, you know, it's like, what? Oh, 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 you know, I went to one agency one time. And they said, are you a parent? Are you here to be a kid? I said, no, I'm, I'm working, you know, so it, it, it's just, it's so, it's constant. Um, and it, it was important for me being in the doctoral, going to doctoral, a doctoral program. It was important for me. I chose the CUNY Graduate Center because it is really diverse, you know, because it does, it, you know, it was a space that I felt like I would have very many different people and people that were black and brown. And, and in fact, my cohort was a, was a, um, was a nice sort of group of people. I kept really good friends with folks and, but, and it was still tr always feeling like you're just fighting to keep up with your white colleagues you know, and who's publishing with who, who's got a, who's got faculty that they're very close with, what, what, how are those connections made, how do I make those connections, you know, um, right, right, and, and it was just, um, you know, so it was always, always trying to find, if I belong, where do I belong, and to have my voice be heard, and to compete with what I know my white colleagues have access to, I barely got into a program, you know, and what I might not have access to. Um, and, you know, a few of my colleagues actually of color, we actually just presented at SWER 
on doctoral students of color, uh, you know, in, in, and peer support. And so we found each other, you know, you find each other and then you find support there um, and really be able to, you know, work together, publish together, um, teach together. Uh, and I'm so happy to be working with uh, Jalana and myself and Courtney and Zuleika. Like I actually feel so empowered by what's happening right now. It's, it, it's mind blowing, blowing to me that that the four of us have found a place in academia to do what we love to do and be black women doing this. And Marion, what you said is so powerful. I do this, I stay here. Like a few times I could have left and be frustrated with how, how the racism and all of the crap that happens here and being overlooked for, for jobs in, in this space and all sorts of stuff we won't get into. I, I, I'm here because of you, Mariam. I'm here because of students who come into my office and say, it's hard to be in this class. It's hard to be in this place. And I'm torn because on the one side, I get it. And it's hard. Karma and I have had these conversations. And the other side, I'm like, please get this degree. Please go get this degree. Please finish this thing, <laughs> you know? But I know I'm putting, I, I don't want to put someone in a situation where they feel like, but it's tearing me, my emotionally getting torn apart in this place. And, and the other part is like, I know you can do it. And next thing, after you finish this, go get your PhD. <laughs> so I'll end. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. I, as you're talking, I'm like, yep, yes, yes. I take that last bit about staying in this space and, you know, Dr. Haldane was right for many, many years. I'd walk the fifth floor and it was very easy to find the two other people that looked like me. And so it was, uh, it was really important to stay because representation matters, right? Dr. Harris, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, everything that folks have already said really resonates with me um, as a Black woman in academia. Um, I'm trying to think of something specific around colorism in academia. I really feel like being a Black woman just... In here trumps that because there are so few of us. But um, I guess one thing that I, I do see coming up around colorism is the policing of blackness. Um, who is who is black and in those sorts of conversations. And for me, that's really resonating right now in this moment with folks, with white folks, particularly white women masquerading as people of color um, so that they can publish and they can get speaking engagements and things like that. And so I think about that in connection with the policing and the community around who is black and um, what, what impact that that's gonna have um, in terms of safe spaces for, for black people. Um, because I think there's already a difficulty in a, in a conversation that needs to happen around um, what we're talking about now, colorism and lighter skinned folks. And, we, and when we have people pretending to be um, black because of the fact that we come in so many different shades and they can easily do that um, becomes I think a really, um, complicated conversation that needs to happen um, because there's a, a serious violation I think that's happening right now with, with people doing that um, in academia, specifically in academia, right? In doctoral programs, professors uh, pretending to have indigenous roots or pretending, you know, to be Latinx, or, you know, whatever it is. So um, that that's somewhere where I specifically see colorism is starting to really, really show up. And this idea of, of how we already have a, an issue where we're sort of policing around blackness in the community. Yeah, Jelana, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking about, it's sort of mu very multi-layered, right? So we have these imposters who are trying to embrace you know, a racial identity that's traditionally marginalized to sort of take advantage of this movement, but they're doing so from a colorist perspective, right? Because they're all fairly lighter skinned and able to, to take advantage of that, uh, the range of our skin tones within the Black community, Black diaspora to say, oh no, I'm, I've got just enough, right? So we're here, this is why you know, it's not just a tan, these are my indigenous or, or Black roots. And I'm wondering if you all can, if uh, any of you can sort of speak to who you see as sort of perpetuating this, this anti-Blackness, perpetuating these ideals of, of colorism where you know, light is right and black is wrong. Like who were, uh, if you had to rank them, I guess. <laughs> you gonna get me kicked out the community. I'm gonna say it, I see black men as huge perpetrators of this. It is, I'm not gonna say they're the only perpetrators, but I see this the most with black men and 
maybe because I have brothers, so they're extra candid and like how they view women. Like at one point, my brother is younger. So at one point he was like grading women by like wood grains. And I was just like, what? is this the game now? And so like, he wouldn't date women that were darker than like this certain wood. And it was like a whole, we got like so many, like we ruined all the holidays fighting over my brother's refusal to date anyone. Like even now his girlfriend's not black. And it's just, I don't know. So like for me, I see black women, black men constantly saying stuff about darker women. Um, if you have a leave, it's bad. If you don't have a leave, it's bad. If you're wearing lashes, if you're not like, no matter what you do, it's, it's a problem. Um, and uh, like, it, I don't know, but that's my top layer pick. Don't y'all leave me out here to dry. <laughs> but, no, I, I hear you. I'm like, I'm, th I'm processing all that. Uh, I think what I'll add to what you what you're saying um, is within communities of color. I guess I'll I'll probably start there. Like we're you know we're so sort of internalized these messages, right? Internalized oppression. We talk about you know all of that. That it's it hurts me actually when sisters are doing to, it to each other, right? And so you know you know it it just kind of like we 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 know what's happening we shouldn't be doing this to each other you know she has this hair or she has that complexion or her nose and and her butt and her this and her that it's like we we're doing it to each other so where's this the sisterhood in in in, in continuing to perpetuate those same kinds of derogatory messages to each other and how can we sort of empower one another you know um, and and compliment and 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 love and embrace all of you know who we are um, and not sort of shut down um, because of anything but like skin color. Um, you should wear a lighter shade thing. You know, one of my colleagues I think was being very nice and telling me that my foundation didn't match; it was too dark. You know, and I, I think she was trying to be nice because you know. <laughs> it's hard to find foundation that matches, right? Let's just, okay. <laughs> so I guess yes. it was pretty dark that day or whatever. And I was giving a presentation and she came up to, she said, uh, is it, and I was like, oh, and I, it's so funny. I immediately was like, oh, shoot. <laughs> okay. You know, it, it was, I, you know, it was, it was, it was layers of like how I was processing like was that tacky, or or even now that I'm talking, was was it bad that I looked dark, or was it like, you know, my neck looked different than my face? But then it was, it was so it's all wrapped up in that, and so I think from a good place, but also there is this underlying kind of message that we're giving to each other that is sometimes really right in your face and really bold, you know. And I think that to me is is we got to we got to pull together. We got to not do that to one another. Yeah, I think I think I'll jump in and, and and include I think more macro elements as well. Like I feel like there's a larger conversation as in terms of just what we know in terms that that lighter skinned folks just appear to they they are more palatable to people in this country, right? And so they're more likely to get hired. Um, there's a lot of evidence that they have higher incomes and lower blood pressure. And so they're there, I think larger elements that are even with outside of our community that are contributing. Um, to this, right? Because, you know, some of what sort of Marion was saying earlier is like, there is a relationship to marriageability. There is a relationship to um, access to work um, and, and those sorts of possibilities. There's a relationship there too. So I think it's within our community, we have all these messages coming out. And then also we just see the evidence um, of what happens when you look lighter, right? We see it in, t in television. We see them getting different types of roles. And if they get roles there, the roles of the prettier, the sexy person and the darker skinned person is like the snapping their fingers girlfriend on the block, you know, like it's, there's, there's all of these, these messages um, that are so much bigger and, out, and outside of our community that we've, we have internalized, but also I think that there's a survival element to it too, right? Like, you know, if, if I don't speak a certain way, if I don't present a certain way, I'm going to be 
um, knocked out of certain opportunities. So there's also this piece of it that's external to us. And I think that those are places where we really need to show up and resist um, because it's bigger than just sort of like this pathology that, you know, like, or trying to sort of pathologize like within the community or being like reductionist about it. It's, it, it's this, this huge um, conversation and we're trying to like navigate all of these things while we also have to still eat. And um, I think that that's something. So when I think of perpetrators, you know, I think of, I think, <laughs> I think white supremacy is the biggest perpetrator. Would you say it's just pervasive in our very existence? I mean, it's uh, messaging is coming from everywhere, right? Whether it's what you see in music videos, as you were saying, Mariam, I mean, I'm thinking now, like even within rap music, if you look at the female artists that are sort of at the, the sort of top of the game, looking at their skin color, sort of what are we, what are we glorifying? from all sides, whether it's our family unit or external society, media, what we're seeing in academia around, you know, with the leadership positions that folks hold and, and the association with their, their skin tone. I wanna be mindful of time. So I know we have, are gonna break out to breakout groups. So Shay, I don't know if you wanna come on and walk us through uh, the next part of our evening. Oh, you're muted. Okay, sorry. So thank you to everyone. You had me in tears. At least I have my glasses on, so it's not, you can't see my um, eyes that are red, but that was fantastic. And I'm um, sorry, we were running late on time, but I would have loved to hear more. But at this point, we're going to transition into the breakout group. So all of you had designated your affinity group, which is going to help us dictate what breakout groups we're going to be in. We're going to be in that those rooms or groups for pretty much until about um, 6.55 or just about maybe three minutes to um, seven o'clock and then we'll rejoin and share some takeaways. So shortly you should be invited to a breakout room and we will see you shortly. I was just talking to Karma about how we want to archive all these different narratives and conversations that are being had like we had an event with OPE and all the heritage panels I mean some of the conversations that come up and and the patterns of the themes like colorism anti-blackness I mean decolonization I am like so humbled by these conversations I'm really excited um Ovita I really want to um just highlight like that comment that you made um I think it was in the meeting for this um specific uh event when you said there's blackness as a like power structure and then there's blackness in terms of the skin color like that's something that I've just been constantly thinking about so I appreciate you like mm, a naming okay. that or voicing okay. that yeah yeah I don't know <laughs> so you know I'm a little drained right now <laughs> it's like, right um and I, I you know I think I think that that's another thing like how do we take care of ourselves how do we find ways because it, you know, to even to share, to, to process literally. Usually I guess we'd go down the block and have a drink, but you know, right? Usually we'd leave these things and be like, whoa, that was heavy. But, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, I mean, I, I, it, we want, we want to have these spaces, but then it's so hard to hold it. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Shay, sounds like you all had a, a robust conversation in your groups. I'm wondering if you should be doing the, the takeaways and the, <laughs> the comes out. I think, um, or maybe we can just share the mic on that. But, uh, you know, if part of our group, and I want to thank everyone for sharing um, just across the board, but I think some of the overarching themes was really clear that though this event is really about centering colorism in the black community, it's, just a, it's a global phenomenon, right? And it's, it's all rooted in these polar opposites of white supremacy and, and anti-blackness. And we've seen uh, sort of the impacts on, on the black community where it's just so internalized, right? And it's impacted us psychologically, mentally, how we have been socialized, how we choose or are attracted to our partners or are not, um, how, we, how it's embedded in our, our familial relationships. So 
Um, if anything, we could say a big takeaway is that it's just so pervasive. It's just such, such an almost natural part of our, our very existence in the air that we breathe and the water that we drink, right? Um, I guess the final takeaway is that we need a part two or a part three. So <laughs> that is your, your call, uh, Shay. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining in our conversation tonight. I especially want to thank uh, the panelists for sharing your, your narratives and your personal stories and being vulnerable in this space. I know that um, in our breakout session, that was one of the first things that folks said that uh, we just really appreciated that it wasn't just an academic conversation that folks were really sharing um, in a very personal and authentic way. So thank you for that. And thank you, uh, Shayi and the Black Lives, uh, the Action for Black Lives Initiative team uh, for putting this together and for inviting all of us. Yeah, thank you everyone. That's it again. Appreciate everyone's participation and, you know, for using your voices for good. That's the whole reason why we're here. So any feedback is appreciated and truly thank you to the entire planning committee for all of their help getting this organized for, you know, the Office of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for getting all of our technology good to go. Samantha, who's part of the ABL team as well. And our panelists, Dr. Harris, Dr. Haldane, Dr. Williams, Mariam, really, thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye.